Welcome, everybody. I have with me Professor Herbert S. Perez, uh, a professor of psychology and psychiatry at Columbia University. His work covers a broad set of research interests that include behaviorism, animal cognition, ape language, and the evolution of language. He is the author of NIM and Why Chimpanzees Can't Learn Language and Only Humans Can. Perez has made important contributions to comparative psychology, many of which have important implications for human psychology. These include discrimination learning, ape language, evolution of language, and animal cognition. Did I get your introduction right, Professor? It's pretty good so far. <laughs> I mean, I just used Wikipedia, so I'm not going to take the credit for it. But you know, you know where I want to begin is uh, your latest book. Um, and I saw a copy of that in one of the bookstores near Columbia University before the apocalypse hit us and we all had to stay at home. And I was wondering why the title is so literal. Why did you choose that for a title? Why the title is so little. Yeah. So literal. Well, um, the original title was uh, Becoming Human. Right. Why Two Minds Are Better Than One. Mm -hmm. But the publisher, Columbia University Press, liked the other title, which is very long, admittedly, Why Chimpanzees Can't Learn Language and Only Humans Can. Right. But that says the whole story. In other words, if somebody understands that title, they don't have to read the book. Right, 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 right. You know, um, and I mean, I guess that is also the central claim of the class that I took with you in some sense, which is that um, humans can speak in languages, animals cannot, and language is afforded to us as an inherent biological resource, a universal grammar that other animals do not, right? Like, it's sort of this, this very solid wall between humans and the rest of the animal species. Okay, the wall is seems solid, mm -hmm. but one of the reasons it seems solid is because when people talk about language, they don't recognize that they're really talking about two or three different phenomena. Mm -hmm. For one thing, they don't distinguish between words and grammar. Mm -hmm. So, let's start with animals. Right. Humans, like animals, communicate. All species, all, almost all species communicate. Hmm. Language is a special case of communication. And language has always been a puzzle for uh, evolutionary theory mm -hmm. because it's the one phenomenon that evolution can't explain. Hmm. The question is, how do you get from animal communication, which is... Um, consists of emotional signals, which are unidirectional. They're not conversational. The reason an animal uh, communicates is to manipulate another uh, organism's behavior. It wants to mate. It wants to attack. It wants to defend. It wants to exclaim that it found food. Those are the contents of animal communication. Hmm. Words, on the other hand, are arbitrary. We have thousands of different languages. I can say eat, I can say manger, um, and so on for all the other languages. Um, and words are learned. Animal communication is not learned. It's hardwired. Hmm. You can't teach an animal a new way to communicate. Right. So, so we're talking about vast differences, and... The critical question in evolutionary theory is how is that jump from animal communication to language, hmm. and in this case, words, how was that accomplished? Right. And I mean, um, so just to, just to be clear on the animal front of communication, it seems like animals have only one directional communication. Only I can say something to you. There is no conversation. That's right. right. That is unidirectional. 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 There is only a limited set of expressions that animals can use, which are purely emotionally driven. Eat, mate, right? right. Stuff like that. And for humans, the, the jump that sort of, I remember Wallace pointing out that the best of animals is so far behind the worst of humans in some sense, in terms That's of correct. the That's evolutionary correct. schema, that the worst of humans, quote unquote, can do so much more with words and, 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 and grammar that animals just cannot. Okay, well, before we get to grammar, let's notice that words are arbitrary mm -hmm. and have to be learned. 
the number of words you can learn is essentially infinite. We can keep adding more and more words to our vocabulary. Right. But a critical feature of words is that they're conversational. Mm -hmm. You and I assume the role of listener and speaker. I'm the speaker, you're the listener. Then we take turns. You're the speaker, I'm the listener. Right. That never happens with animals. Right. So even before we get to grammar, we have conversation and we have arbitrary symbols for words. Right. Right. And um, I, I guess the book that you recently wrote has two stories embedded in them. The first story is the evolution of language. The second story is the, the, the history of the speculation on why humans evolved language. Okay. Right? Before, we, before we get to that story, right. I have to make clear that like everybody else, when I started my research with chimpanzees, I had a very naive view of language. Mm -hmm. I did not differentiate between words and grammar. Mm -hmm. I was motivated by Chomsky's claim that only humans have language. I was also motivated by Skinner's claim that language is simply a collection of conditioned responses. And I followed some other psychologists in trying to show Skinner was right by trying to train a chimpanzee right. to use language, not spoken language because they're not, they don't have the articulatory apparatus to speak. Right. It's my language, and we know that they can use gestures, and there were projects that had already attempted to use sign language. So that was my aim. Um, the aim was actually to get a chimpanzee to produce sentences in sign language. Right. I, this was a very naive view of language at the time. Right. Right, but let's let's pull it back a little further before we come to your conclusive evidence, uh, your conclusive experiment <clears throat> on this question. Let me let me take you back to Skinner, or if there was anybody speculating on the question of language before Skinner, but um, Skinner spoke about language as a simple learned conditioned behavior. Am I right? That's correct. <clears throat> spoke about individual words as conditioned behavior, and he spoke about sentences as chain strings of conditioned behavior. So, so, the, so that would imply that you can basically reward somebody to speak in a certain way. For instance, if I say, mother, I want milk. And if my mother gives me the milk, the reward has been received by me. And I have learned to say, mother, I want milk to get the milk. That's from Skinner's point of view. That's the whole story. Right. That's, that's what Skinner said. And Skinner divided his language understanding into man's and tacts. Right. Man's are for demanding things. Right. That's what the term comes from. Tacts mean to point to something. It comes from the Latin tactus. So right. when you uh, identify a tree, you're pointing, you're calling attention to the tree as a separate object. Right. So when I point to a tree and call it a tree, that's a tact. And when I say Hey, give me that fruit. I'm demanding the fruit. So that is a man. Sure. Right. And then Chomsky, uh, who was considerably young back then, is, sub, uh, is, is famous for writing what is called a scathing critique of Skinner's approach to language. That's what made him famous. Right. And his claim was that there is some kind of a universal grammatical structure coded into our minds as a function of our genes. Am I correct? That's correct, but what he, what he also did, and he was brilliant at this, he attacked Skinner's view of sentences and showed that it just logically doesn't work. I won't go into the detail, but mm -hmm. it's devastating. Right. The argument that sentences are just strings of conditioned responses, Chomsky conclusively showed that that was wrong. Right. But there are two interesting things there. The first is that he left Skinner's definition of words, which was that words are just arbitrary sounds that we attach meaning to alone. Right. And, and, and I'm going to try and phrase Chomsky's critique very succinctly. And we don't have to get into the deep ends of that, but just tell me if I'm correct. He basically said that mother, I want milk is a specific sentence. It is not mother milk want I that works as well. So there is an infinite ways to connect the same sentence, but only one works. 
and that is why there must be an intuition for it. Right. 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 So words we can classify on one end as arbitrary sounds that we consensually as a community decide that they mean a certain things. But that's not the whole story because mm-hmm. with arbitrary sounds, we have to add the speaker and the listener. What does that mean? So, for example, if I want milk, I can say to my mother, milk, and she can give me milk. I can go to a vending machine and push a button and get milk. And from Skinner's point of view, that's the same act. Mm -hmm. But if we're sitting in a restaurant and I say, please pass the milk, um, you ask do you want this glass or that glass? There's a conversation there. Right. These are two totally different kinds of communication. One you is unidirectional. As I say, you can have a vending machine provide the milk. The other requires a listener hmm. to translate what I'm trying to say to produce an, an outcome. Right, right. So for for something to be within the domain of language, it requires a speaker and a listener. That's that's right. Right. And so in the meanwhile, while all this was happening, I'm I'm given to assume that there were enough research on animal language that had been taking place for a very long time, where animals were being taught how to speak. Actually not, no. Um, There were a few attempts to teach chimpanzees to speak. And they fail, as I say, because they don't have the articulatory apparatus to make sounds. Right. And then somebody raised the question, well, is it that they're not smart enough to learn language or they just lack the articulatory apparatus? Mm -hmm. And that's why Alan and Beatrice Gardner um, followed a suggestion of a primatologist to use gestures as a way of um, communicating using American Sign Language. Right. So um, speech was, those those were the only attempts to teach animals language at that time. But there is a significant tradition up until you decided to try and teach your chimpanzee a language of trying to teach chimpanzees both verbal language and sign language, right? Well, I I try to teach sign language, not, not verbal language. No, you try to teach sign language, but up until you started doing your experiment, there were enough researchers from... Um, oh, there were the Kellogg's and the Hayes, and there was one Russian. Right. I'd say maybe five or six people tried to and, and some of them did go on to make at least, you, I would say, half-baked claims that animals were speaking, uh, or animals were... None of them said that? No, none of them said that. They got chimpanzees, they moved the lips into a certain position, and then the trainer would come and pat the chimpanzee in the back, and out would come up, you know, or mom. Right. But these were not natural sounds. So none of those experiments were considered successful. Fair, fair. And then uh, there there was your experiment, which you at first concluded was that the the chimpanzee was actually communicating. But then you realized it wasn't. That's right. What what happened is I modeled my experiment on one that the gardeners did. And I was very impressed by that experiment. But I decided that the reports were anecdotal. For example, it was claimed that the main chimpanzee at the time, Washo, um, created a sentence by saying Waterbird while she was on a, in a rowboat and passed the swan. And the trainer said, my God, combining water and bird an adjective and noun to produce a s- small phrase, that's language. And I said, well, I'm not so sure because that's only one anecdote. We don't know if there was any prior training on water and on bird. We don't know if maybe Washoe actually said bird, water, and the trainer heard it in the English way, water and bird. So what's needed is a corpus. You need to record everything, the chimpanzee sign, and 
Uh, that's what's done. That's what's done with studies of children language, um, and then you go through all the constructions and ask: Are there orders? Do adjectives typically come before nouns? Um, do pronouns come before verbs, and so on? And that was the purpose of my study: simply to use the same method, but to collect a corpus where I had literally thousands of combinations. Right, and. What is this uh, particular instance that made you realize that your first conclusion about the fact that your chimpanzee, Nim Chimsky, was actually speaking uh, was wrong? Well, actually, I collected more than 20,000 combinations of two or more signs. And I saw some very dramatic regularities. I saw instances where adjectives did come before nouns, where pronouns did come before verbs. And I wrote a paper, and I sent it to science. And while it was being processed by science, I made a startling discovery that the combination, the signs that my chimpanzee, Nim, made were prompted by the teacher inadvertently. The teachers were so intent on getting at the sign that they began signing to him unconsciously before he signed. Mm. And when I saw that connection, that prompting, I realized that his signing was not spontaneous, that it could be explained as imitative of the teacher's signs, and therefore I concluded that Chomsky was right. This is not language, this is imitation. Right. And I, I guess even after you had put that conclusive dent in this area of research, there were continued researches and even claims of, of um, chimpanzees, like I think it was Coco, the, the one that appeared in a Pepsi commercial and so on. That Coco was a gorilla trained by Francine Patterson. Right. And, and the claim was that Coco could speak language, but you maintained that there was no possible way that was happening. I, what I did was I analyzed not only my own videotapes to show the connection between the teacher's prompts and uh, NIMS um, signing, but I analyzed films of Coco signing with Francine Patterson. I analyzed films of Washoe signing with Beatrice Gardner, and I saw the same pattern. Every place I look, I saw the connection between the teacher's prompt and the H signing. And I said, if maybe if I didn't do a great experiment, maybe somebody could have done a better experiment, but if somebody wants to challenge my conclusion, what they have to do is produce a videotape that's not edited so you can see all the context between the teacher and the chimpanzee, and also show that teacher was not feeding rewards to the chimpanzee signing. And if somebody can produce a 15-minute videotape showing that the chimp is spontaneously signing, I'm wrong. Hmm. I made that challenge more than 30 years ago, and videotape is cheap, and nobody has come up with a videotape. Interesting. 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 I'm. It's so ironical that this entire series of experiments and research has more to say about human cognition and the unconscious human activity than it has to do of conscious animal activity. Oh, sure. There's a very famous story, and I'm ashamed to tell it, called the Clever Hans effect, where a German psychologist thought he could um, get a chimpanzee to do arithmetic. He would write on the blackboard two plus three, and the horse would tap his foot five times. Right. And other people asked the same question, um, and they got the same results. It took about two years to discover that the horse watched the trainer very intently, and when the trainer posed the problem, he took a deep breath in. And when the horse tapped the right number of times, the trainer exhaled. And then that's when the horse stopped tapping. Right. So when he inhaled, the horse started tapping. When he exhaled, the horse stopped. 
that explained the horse's behavior. I did this experiment, never thinking I would get anything like that, but unconsciously the teachers were prompting them. And when I took that out of the picture, there was no language. It is so interesting that the blueprint of all of these mistakes was embedded in this one little experiment from history that almost nobody cared to look at until you figured it out. That's right. Right. So, yeah. so tell me what's happening. How did, how did language even evolve? Like, how is it this magical phenomena of conversation coming about? Okay. Well, so I published my negative results many years ago, 1979. And then I, Ask myself, why can't a, an intelligent creature like a chimpanzee produce language? And I have no answers. But then I started reading paleoanthropology, and I learned about many species that evolved after chimpanzees, before humans appeared. These fossils were discovered essentially after my project ended. So I got a picture of later developments phylogenetically in our ancestry. I also noticed that developmental psychologists who study infants were making profound discoveries about what an infant did during the first year before she produced the first word. Infant speaks the first word at about 12 months. But during the first year, the infant goes through some remarkable relations with the mother, first emotional and then cognitive, which are necessary for the production of that first word. And that development doesn't occur in primates or any other animal. So I learned two reasons why humans can produce words and chimpanzees can't. Um, we needed a more recent ancestor, um, and I followed the suggestion of other linguists, the Homo erectus, an ancestor who emerged about two million years ago, produced the first words. And we also have to take into account what is universal in all children in the relations they form cognitively and emotionally with their mother before they produce the first word. So now I realized that an awful lot goes into the production of a name and that chimpanzees were miles and miles away from the brain power and the cooperation needed to uh, produce something like a name. Interesting. So the, the, the bottleneck of development of language in humans is around the, the infancy stage of human development. And it has to do with the interaction between the child and the parent. That's correct. See, humans are different from all other primates in that human infants are cradled. They're born with their brains uh, not as developed as a chimpanzee's brain at birth. And that's because when we became bipedal, the, the pelvis shrank and the birth canal shrank. So that placed the limit on the size of the brain at birth for human infants. So not only was its brain relatively small compared to its adult size, but it's whole neuromuscular developmental system was weak. So babies can't crawl until they're six months. That's why they have to be cradled. But therein lies one of these quirks of nature. Because a baby is cradled, she's about seven inches from her mother's eyes, and during her waking hours, she spends most of that time staring into her mother's eyes. And that begins a emotional connection between the mother and the infant, which is the first step towards language, something that um, chimpanzees don't have. Right. So it is this, this connection that you form with, that the child forms with the mother first, which forms the first node of understanding itself that later gets translated into language. Right. 
Now, there's still an awful lot we have to learn, but one experiment studied the sounds that an infant makes in three months. These aren't even, um, this isn't even before babbling. These are cries, whimpers, coos, and the mother responds. And the amazing thing about that experiment is that the connection between the infant's sounds and the mother's sounds were conversational. They take turns. Mm. So even before words appeared, there is a back and forth like there is between a speaker and a listener with real words. But this is not even before language appeared. You have that same conversational relation, and that is necessary eventually for a language. Right. And the first words uh, we supposed appeared around Homo erectus. My my question is, is there, do, do we take the first words to be first verbal sounds or do we take them to be first pieces of art? It doesn't, it doesn't make any difference. The point is, they could be gestures, they could be combinations of gestures and sounds, but the theory about Homo erectus is that because that creature had such a big brain, and that brain places a tremendous demand on nutrition and calories, the most efficient source of those calories was, were, was meat. And Homo erectus wasn't able to hunt big animals, but they could scavenge them. And the theory is that a Homo erectus scout encountered a dead zebra, a, a dead elephant, and then had to go many miles to his base and communicate, there's a dead elephant way out there. And um, he had to do that without being able to point to the elephant. So, and that was the real breakthrough, because it's one thing to respond to a person or an animal that somebody else could see. But he had to get the other members of his group to think about what he just experienced. And that was, according to this theory, the basis for the first words. Mm -hmm. To get them to come with him to help scavenge the dead elephant so they can get meat that will grow their brains. This is this is the point at which we are entering sort of the evolutionary language of describing things, right? Where we right. Have to because it's needed for survival. Right. right. So, so um, it's and this is particularly us talking about the evolution of words, not the evolution of grammar yet. No, the, the theory is that Homo erectus used words for a million years in any order, um, and they communicated just fine that way. But when their vocabulary began to grow, and people couldn't remember the whole string of words that rules were invented to order words in certain ways, and that's where grammar came from. That's the theory. Right. So to, to, to go back to this, um, this uh, African grassland example that we took, right? It presupposes that Homo erectus were traveling in groups, and they could not hunt because they have no special claws or teeth to hunt, so they would eat whatever was left off that other animals had killed. Right. But they had to coordinate for that. And right. that coordination, which could be over time and over space, had to be communicated. Exactly and, right. And, that, and that communication required thinking about the animal that could be seen to organize the other Homo erectus to go and see the animal. Right. And I think there is something very unique at this particular point of um, our evolutionary history is that we are referring to something that is not present immediately there. Right. Which is true that's, for... Well, that's, that's crucial because that, that means that both parties have to think about something. They can think about something that happened yesterday. They can think about something that might happen tomorrow. They can even think about imaginary things all without any grammar. Which is not the case for other animals. They cannot no. say... They cannot talk about anything imaginary. There is no... no 
Okay, so so at this particular point where human coordination was very important, Homo erectus coordination was very important. It was the need to eat over long distances that sort of gave rise for to for us to speak. In. Right, right. And how how uh, how do how do psychologists think about or evolutionary theorists think about intelligence in view of language? Like, did it evolve before language? Were we well, animal, well chimp, chimpanzees, monkeys, other animals are very intelligent mm -hmm. that they can solve various problems, but they don't use language to solve those problems. So they have, they, their cognitive development is impressive, but it's all within them. Uh, animals can't, don't have a concept that there are other minds. They only read another animal's behavior. So within their own selves... They're, they're quite sophisticated cognitively and have intelligence, but they can't communicate about anything. Right. Would you say that uh, language makes for a means of amplifying intelligence in humans? Oh, of course, of course. I mean, we could not really um, think as well as we do without language. Right, right, because it provides a systematic way of putting many mental concepts together. That's correct. Right. Uh, there are two very interesting raw material that I picked out from our description of evolution of language. Uh, one of them is what you said about other minds, the theory of mind, the fact that I can perceive that you have a mind of your own, which is uniquely human, also connected to the infant, getting informed through looking at the mother's eye that she is thinking about something. There is a certain emotional state attached to the mother. So that forms one part of the whole thing. The second forms part of much of the evolutionary hypotheses that come from around the 2 million to 1 million years old mark, which is the need to socially coordinate. Right. That, that we were so helpless that all we had was we could throw because our shoulders were sort of still the same from hanging that we were banding together out of helplessness. Humans not only have language, but they are the most cooperative species. It turns out that we, before we had language, we had to learn to cooperate much more, say, than any chimpanzee ever could. So chimpanzees can be trained to cooperate, but they don't do it naturally. Whereas a human child will, at six months, try to please the mother by giving her something she can't find. You never see anything like that in a chimpanzee. And the question came up, why are we so pro-social? Why are we so cooperative? And a very famous anthropologist named Sarah Artie um, suggested that Homo erectus was an example of what's called collective breeding, where unlike a chimpanzee, who won't let you get near an infant for six months. Um, infants born in a collective breeding society have what are called allo parents, a sibling, a grandmother, actually another member of the group will be allowed to take care of that infant. So that infant not only has to learn to please its natural mother, it has to learn to please what are called other allo parents. And Artie's uh, theory is that that is a major source of cooperation where an infant has to learn to please many different individuals. And that is considered a root of human cooperation. Right. So when we, when we uh, theorize evolutionarily on this phenomena and we understand that words evolved sooner than grammar did, that grammar evolved as a means of arranging words, symbols that we had attached mental concepts to, voices, sounds that we attached mental concepts to, how is it that grammar got coded into our genes and words did not? Well, grammar is not in our genes. Um, there are dispositions to use words, but nobody has come up with even the beginning of a suggestion of the genetic base, the basis of grammar. Now, Chomsky thinks that 
there was a mutation about 100,000 years ago that produced an operation, grammatical operation called recursion. Um, there's no evidence for that. But that is his way of explaining language through this mutation. But Chomsky has no explanation of where words came from. So um, all the theory about um, the neural basis of language is a theory. Mm -hmm. it, it, it makes a certain amount of sense that there is an underlying universal grammar of all languages, but what the uh, genetic or neural basis of that is, nobody knows. Right. And, I mean, I'm given to assume that anything that gets coded in the genes is a hard-earned process for the genes to acquire. It's not over few lifetimes, it's over several lifetimes of very strong selective pressures against the cost of acquisition. That Thousands goes. of lifetimes, millions of lifetimes. Right, precisely. And so it seems a little odd to me that it would be that verbs come before, pronouns come before verbs would be something so deeply ingrained into us that it would be genetic. Well, but you see, what happens is that once our ancestors had words and they began to um, use them between each other, something extraordinary happened in evolution. We not only had biological evolution, we had cultural evolution. Because now one generation could remember the words from another generation. And as that went forward, they could remember rules that were made up. But those were culturally defined. Those were not biologically defined. So there are conventions as to, in this language, how you combine words, in that language, how you combine words. Um, those were not selected because of survival in the, in the true evolutionary sense. They were selected culturally. And animals don't have that culture. Right. So it is. Um, so 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 the idea would be that grammar would be a form of cultural evolution, big on right. top yeah. of the biological evolution, not within the biological evolution. As far as I can tell, yes. Right. And would you say that culture precedes language, or did language instantiate this grand culture that we are a part of? Culture came later. First, some ancestor, whether it's Homo erectus or somebody else or even old homo sapiens, had to invent words. And as they began to use words, um, culture emerged from that. Right. It is, it is very interesting to me that there is sort of a parallel uh, with the evolutionary hypotheses pre-Darwin and post this understanding of cultural evolution that are sort of, you know, uh, that sort of makes sense. So Lamarck, uh, famously said that, you know, giraffes have longer necks because they keep trying to reach for the, uh, the, the leaves. Yes. Basically saying that what an animal learns in one lifetime gets passed on to the other one. The, his, Lamarck was wrong. Yes, Lamarck was wrong. But in, in the cultural evolution space, that is exactly what is happening, right? It's not biological, but it's culturally Lamarckian. That's correct. Right, right. So it is that everything that uh, my father has learned, can, he can give it to me. And in that limited sense, we are Lamarck. And you can give it to your children. That's right, right, right. And, and so this, this two million point mark that we, you know, take, take to be the beginning of language is basically, I would say, some sort of an engine to the massive progress that has happened over the last two million years as compared to, you know, the forever history before that. Because language made that possible. Because language allowed culture to evolve in some sense. That's right. Right. But you have to start with the word. And that was the, that was the big jump for manual communication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That forever changed things. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so the big jump from animal communication came as a need for displaced reference. As a need right. to point to something that was not present. You, exactly right. 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 I am also curious because this, uh, all of what we've discussed right now, uh, I did take a class with you about that. And the class was titled Evolution of Intelligence and Consciousness. And we sort of covered the intelligence aspect when it comes to language influencing intelligence. 
is there any co- is there any connection between language and consciousness because i experience myself consciously in language i speak to myself i we can only we can only speculate about that absolutely I, skinner i think had some good ideas about that the i and, well in one sense i agree with freud that most of what we do and what we think is unconscious in other words i am not consciously preparing the words that i'm saying to you in this conversation so only a tiny percent of our activity are we conscious of and the question is what is the function of consciousness and skinner's idea is that we become conscious of certain behaviors so we can be responsible for those behaviors because without responsibility we're not a human you know society so over time we teach our our children to be aware of what they're doing physically eventually what they're thinking and consciousness i think is sustained awareness all animals have momentary awareness what language does is give us a way to sustain that awareness Hmm. And I think the function of that is ultimately to make us responsible for what we're thinking and saying. Interesting. And is there a speculation as to why this need to be responsible might emerge in our evolutionary history? Well, if we don't have responsibility, we can't say that somebody is wrong in doing something. Hmm. There has to be a set of conventions that you can't murder somebody, you can't attack somebody, you can't steal from somebody, you can't lie to somebody. These are all social conventions. But in order to get people to behave according to those rules, you have to make them aware of what they're doing. So when children get into a fight, they can do that unconsciously, but they have to be taught that they're getting into into a fight and they have to be made aware of their physical behavior and their anger and that's where consciousness comes in. so the selective pressure is again the organizational force that we need to organize and we need to stay together and band together right i'm also very curious because there is there seems to be this very unique element associated to human cognition which is that of time and humans are not very good at understanding time either but language and displaced reference did facilitate some amount of movement through time right yeah. i wonder if this organizing this this need to organize human societies even 2 million years ago our tribes to organize our tribes combined with our ability to now process some amount of time bred the need to be responsible hey i asked you to do this yesterday did you do this so i have to be more responsible because now i can cognize over time yes i i agree with that that could make sense huh yes i see i see i am also curious as to how the history of the evolution of language the evolution of words because up until now we've covered the journey of how the first word could possibly evolved and then from there how grammar might have possibly evolved but i'm curious to know if what this evolution of language has to say about the future of language there are particular domains one within the computer science end of things where we are trying to teach computers how to understand language right and then the other is uh, is just the natural course of language evolving like lol was an internet word 20 years ago now is a common word people use in in okay computers. let's talk about the first question about computers right um computers can do fantastic things but one thing they lack are emotions nobody knows how to program a computer to have emotions and i think emotions are fundamentally a part of human language we don't know how uh pascal made a very important observation the heart has reason that reason will never know so so much of what we say and think and express are emotionally influenced and until we can figure out how to get one computer to be aware of another computer's emotions uh i don't think that's going to get very far 
So we can develop fantastic programming languages. Um, even when it comes to something like uh, machine translation, if I wanted to translate Russian into English or English into Russian, there are metaphors that a computer can't understand uh, because a computer doesn't it is based on a set of individual rules, not about rules and feelings of someone else. So I think there are important limitations into what a computer can do. Right. I'm. Uh, it's. It's. Um, I think it was JC JCC Sir. I, I. I'm forgetting who wrote that paper, talking about how computers don't truly understand that you cannot ascribe intentionality to them. John Sir wrote the paper. John Sir. Yes. Right. And I'm. 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 In, I'm interested because it seems like Skinner's view on conditioning also sort of makes words out to be without devoid of meaning that they are only compressed versions of real life actions. I agree with that. That's, right? one, the, that's one of the limitations of scare. Interesting. And as far as, um, is there, is there a speculation within the field about how words continue to grow, how language continues to evolve? That's a totally separate question. I mean, how existing language evolves is a fundamentally different question from how language evolved in the first place. So we, I mean, we do know um, old English, we know some very ancient languages, we know about Sanskrit and we can, and linguists can look at the process of how language, which does have grammar and words, um, existed 5,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago, but that's a very different question from how language evolved originally. Mm. And as far as the certainty about how language evolved originally, because I think the right place to place language as uh, a part of our everyday reality is it's it's some sort of a super phenomena, almost working on its own accord in a consensual free market, like the evolution of language right now, all of that. And the, the fact that language breeds culture and, and culture influences our life in so many ways. How how sure are we about the theory that you prescribe in this book about, you know, displaced reference and me having to invite people to come hunt the zebra or to scavenge the zebra and such. How sure are we? Well, I'll put it how sure we are. I'll try to summarize the book in one simple observation. What makes us unique is that we can name things. Hmm. Animals can discriminate things like trees and people and flowers, but they can't name things. And I think the critical step in human evolution was when one ancestor referred to another object with a name. And that's very different from um, discrimination. Dog, from a dog responding to a command because, you know, that's just comprehension. I'm talking about the production of a name. So I can tell you that man over there is Tom. That flower is called a rose. Uh, that is a mountain. And to have you understand that the name refers to that, that, that is a critical step. Mm -hmm. what, are the, what are the current questions that bother your field right now? What are the current speculations within this domain? Within the domain of the evolution of language? Yes, yes. Oh, well, there are so many. <laughs> the first, I'll give you some interesting questions that I don't, I'd love to hear some answers. Right. We think that Homo erectus, who is responsible for the inventions of names, what were the first 10 words that Homo erectus spoke? Hmm. A novelist could write a novel about the early speech of Homo erectus. How did they get along with the language? Nobody knows the answer to that question. Then the next question is, how did small vocabularies precipitate grammar? Okay. And um, probably 
original words and the uses of words were in the present, how the past and future and you know, other um, developments in language emerge. We don't know. We can, we can only try to think back and speculate, but we don't have answers to those questions. Right. Right. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I'll have, a, I'll have some questions to think about when it comes to this stuff. But uh, I have one last question. And that is, given that there are so many holes in our understanding of our evolutionary history, the selective pressures, natural selection, why, are we still very bent on Darwinism to explain this phenomena? I mean, the co-creator of, or the co or the co, I, I don't know what the right, the co-author of the theory of natural selection, uh, Alfred Wallace, did eventually pull away from Darwin's view. He said there were other forces that Darwin had not comprehended. Well, well the reason Wallace pulled away was because he couldn't see why, how our intellectual ability could have been selected. It was too good. In other words, we should have just been a tiny bit smarter than an ape, and we would have been fine. But we're so much smarter, and he could understand why we have such a well-developed brain, or put it in other words, such a superior intelligence. And that's where the theory of scavenging and homo erectus came in. Somebody had to come along and say, well, that increase in intelligence was needed for survival. And the idea there is that meat is needed for the enlarged brain of our ancestor. And once our ancestor began to talk about meat and scavenging and all of that, that took us away from simple animal communication. And that was the bridge to cultural evolution eventually to get us where we are now. Mm, 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 mm. All right. I think, I think as far as uh, my questions are concerned, I'm done. Do you have any questions for me? No, no, I think it's been very, very good conversation. Thank you so much for being here, Professor Terrace. This has been an absolute pleasure. Good. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay.